Okay, it's football happy hour, and all this hour we are going to pick week two against the spread. Pete Prisco is here, off to a really good start. What were you last week against Nine, the spread? Nine, six, and one. Nine, six, and one. Unlike somebody else in this show. That somebody else is also joining us, Brady Quinn. Uh, sub 500 first week, but Brady looking to get back on the right track today. Did you know how good of a week Pete had, Brady? I, I did usually he gloats about it. I think I was seven and nine. I'm a little bit confused where Pete got the tie in there. The push. Maybe I needed to get a push then. But, but as our Bill, producer, Jack, uh, no, oh, the Bengals and uh, Chargers push. Brady, you are uh, reportedly six nine and one. Not reportedly, he is. Week. So you're three six, games nine. behind old Petey Pan. It's not fake Pace. news. It's real news. Let's start with the Thursday night football game. A must win for the Cleveland Browns if they want to get to the playoffs this season. It's 0-1 Cincinnati, looked better than advertised in week one. Some would say probably should have won that game that they played against the 0-1 Cleveland Browns. Brady, the Browns are favored by six at home. Yeah, this is kind of a scary game for me to try to pick because it's hard looking at the Cleveland Browns as bad as they looked in week one, thinking that they should be a six-point favorite now as they head into a short week and trying to fix some of the issues that they face. And on top of that, this is a banged up football team. You look at their offensive line, a number of starters not practicing have been out this week. Don't know what their status is going to be for this game. Uh, now, granted, it's not the best pass rush against the Cincinnati Bengals, but they're very capable. Uh, but on the flip side, the problem for the Bengals is no Geno Atkins, no Mike Daniels. So maybe there's an opportunity for the Cleveland Browns to run the football with Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt, something that supposedly Kevin Stefanski was going to rely on. Maybe Lamar Jackson, the Baltimore Ravens, getting off such a big lead uh, last week in week one, forced them to get away from the run. But this might be a pick uh, I'm going to regret. But home teams tip we had of an advantage on the short week. Uh, even though the home field advantage hasn't had quite as much of an advantage, I just think Joe Burrow, even though he looked great at the end of the game and that two-minute drive to give them a chance to win, he did look like a rookie, along with Jonah Williams, who I thought struggled at times, too, the left tackle. He didn't play last year as a rookie. This is essentially his rookie season. I think the Browns win this one. They try to make a statement and get things back on track. The t Browns sure didn't look like a 10-win team to me. I know that for a fact. They looked I awful. I said 9 and team, though, Pete. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm kidding, Brady. I know you have loyalty to the Browns. And I think the Browns will win this game. But, you know, you talked about Joe Burrow playing quarterback. What about Baker Mayfield? It's time. It is his time to start playing better football. He has not played like a guy we saw as a rookie a couple years ago. It's not even close to it. I think he has to play better. I think he will play better here. Uh, I also think that Joe Burrow will play well as, as well in this game. I think this is one of those situations where the home field advantage kind of goes out the window because it's such a short trip. There are no fans. It's one of those situations where it's even from that standpoint. So I'll take the Bengals and the points. But I do think the Browns win the football game. Here are some numbers, Brady, for Baker Mayfield. Uh, last start, uh, second worst yards per attempt in his career, 4.85. And, Brady, he now has an interception in seven straight games. That's by far the longest streak in the NFL. Yeah, it's not good, especially, too, when you look at David Njoku, who actually you know, looked like he might be a mismatch for him this season. Now he's on IR. Uh, you hear potential rumors that Odell Beckham's being shopped around. I don't know how much – validity there is to that report but clearly there's a chemistry disconnect between Baker Mayfield and Odell Beckham so look there's a lot of concerns but I also feel like the Bengals uh, there's a lot of concerns too I'm not like P I don't think the Chargers are a very good football team I think they have a good pass rush but that's about it right now so I look at that game and kind of say really how good of a performance was that from Cincinnati I'm saying the same thing about the Cleveland Browns and that's why this game is such a toss-up for me. But I think early in the season, I've got to give the edge to the home team in the short week. The question now becomes this week, if Baker Mayfield struggles, are you starting to doubt him as the starting quarterback? Don't you future? think there's already people that are doubting him? Not yet, because I think people saw last season as more of an aberration because of the coaching staff and he didn't have good tackles. And now it's a new staff. If he doesn't play well this week, I think those questions are going to really bubble to the surface wondering if he is the long-term answer. I tend to believe he is, but he has to play, he has to play better. Ready? Let's not forget, too, guys, Case Keenum's on this roster. Not only A, is he really experienced, but he also has familiarity with the offense and Kevin Stefanski. You know, clearly he was brought in for a reason. Um, as much as it was the tutor, Baker Mayfield, maybe it's there to be a, a, a stopgap, if you will, until whoever the next guy would be. I think after what the Arizona Cardinals did, drafting Josh Rosen as the number 10 overall pick, in one year's draft, 
firing Steve Wilkes after one year, trading Josh Rosen after that, hiring a new head coach and drafting Kyler Murray number one overall. That basically puts everything on the table now for every NFL team since someone else has already set the precedent. And, Pete, it's not like we haven't seen Jimmy Haslam fire a coach after one year anyway. He got rid of Freddie Kitchens last year and just hired Kevin Stefanski. So it's been a dumpster fire in Cleveland forever. So I, I think everything's on the table at this point, depending on how the season goes. Joe Mixon licking his chops after kind of a lackluster week one. Last season had his two highest rushing games of his career against the Browns, went for 162 and 146, respectively. Moving on to the Sunday game, CBS, 1 p.m. Eastern time. The Broncos, 0-1, short week, late Monday night football loss, heartbreaking loss to the Titans. At the 1-0 Steelers, who some people were sleeping on in the offseason, Big Ben off to a nice start. Yeah, he played well, and it took him a little while to get going. Mm -hmm. You could tell there was a little rust there, but I thought he bounced back and played really well. And I think if he plays like this, and that defense is what it is, I said it before the season. I think they have a chance to be a deep playoff team. I'm not going to say they're going to the Super Bowl, but they are a legitimate contender. And Roethlisberger looked like the Roethlisberger of old. He made a lot of good passes. And again, though, it took him a little while to get going. Benny Snell looked good running the football. Yeah. The line looked better. Uh, and then Juju Smith-Schuster looked like himself again. That's a good team. The Broncos on the other side have issues. They have a lot of injury issues. They, now they lost A.J. Boye the corner. He's out to go with Von Miller on the defense. Uh, the wide receiver position, we don't know what Sutton's status will be. It looks like he might play, but how effective will he be? They have injury issues, and this is a tough turnaround to go face that team in a short week. Uh, that defense is outstanding. Ready? Pete, you don't need to say it. I'll go ahead and say it. I think Pittsburgh's not only a Super Bowl team. I think they might, they're going to win it this year. Uh, that was at least my prediction. And, and you're right, Ben started off slow, but he did get it together. And I think this, this, this group of wide receivers, when you look at Juju Smith-Schuster, as you mentioned, now healthy. But even Deontay Johnson, if him and Ben get on the same page, looked like there was a bit of a disconnect. They could be dangerous. Claypool clearly seems like he's going to be a, an option, too, as well as Eric Ebron. And then you mentioned Benny Snell. How about with the weight loss? How much better he's running the football? How much better he looks, more agile? Uh, my only concern, I think, in this matchup is when you look at that front for the Denver Broncos with Bradley Chubb, who I, I do think is going to do a good job in replacing some of what they've lost, obviously, with Von Miller, is their tackles. Pete, you said it last year. Villanueva was taking a step back. I didn't see too many promising things versus a New York Giants team that would make me think that he's taken that next next step forward. And it looks like they've lost Zach Banner, who was playing right tackle for them. Uh, so what does that mean on the edges? So that's a bit of a concern. But this should be an easy win for the Pittsburgh Steelers offense. I think Big Bang knocked off a lot of that rust. And I think for Drew Locke, it'd be nice to have Corlin Sutton. It'd be nice to have Phillip Lindsay. I don't know that he's going to have either. And on top of that, it's a young group. They just look too inconsistent for me. So I got the Steelers. You laid the points on this one. Steelers did a great job against the Giants run game, made Saquon Barkley pretty much non-existent in that run game. They held the Giants to 29 rushing yards. Elsewhere early on Sunday, we have the 0-1 Falcons at the 0-1 Cowboys, two prolific offenses. Falcons put up a lot of points, but were never really in that game last weekend against Seattle. Cowboys only scored 17 points in the loss to the Rams, Pete. Yeah, and that was on the road. And Dak Prescott doesn't play that well on the road. He plays really well at home. I think this might be one of those high-scoring games. Uh, you saw the Falcons' defense get shredded by Russell Wilson last week. Matt Ryan put up some big yard yardage numbers, and the receivers caught a bunch of passes. But that was a lot of garbage time. It wasn't in early part of the game. So they need to get going. This is almost a must-win for these two teams. I thought the Falcons would be a playoff team. Uh, I still think they have a chance, but it has to start Sunday, and that means they have to be better on defense. You have to be able to get off the field. Russell Wilson carved them up. Dak Prescott has to be licking his chops. This could be one of those up and down uh, the field games where both teams score a lot of points. I think it's going to be tight, but I think this is going to be a fun game to watch. Uh, I will say this. When you look at the Dallas offensive line, it's not the same without Lyle Collins at right tackle, and they also didn't have Travis Frederick, remember, in the middle of that line. They have to be better up front. They have to be better, and it's going to be a challenge, too, I think, when you look at, at least in my opinion, the way Grady Jarrett played last week. They did, did, did get a sack at attack McKinley. He's in a big year for him. And then Dante Fowler played a little bit of a factor, too, in getting some pressure. But uh, look, the secondary is going to be the issue, I think, for the Falcons. They're young. Terrell, the first pick, you know, he's going to be matched up with either Amari Cooper at some point, Michael Gallup at some point, or CeeDee Lamb. And so he's got his work cut out for him. I think this is a big opportunity for Dak Prescott 
to, to put up a lot of production, a lot of points. But as we saw from Matt Ryan last week, we know the Falcons can do that too. And I don't know that the secondary can match up with Julio Jones and Calvin Ridley. So I'm with Pete. I think obviously the prognosticators think this could be a high scoring affair. I like the over in this more than necessarily taking Atlanta in the four and a half points, but uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and be on the side with Pete here on this one. I think Atlanta keeps this one close in a high scoring game. And Pete, you haven't picked the line yet. Yeah, you I'll like take it? the Falcons plus the points. And yeah. I also think it's going over. It wouldn't shock me to see the Falcons win this game. It wouldn't shock me at all. I think that's possible. Can you imagine if the Cowboys go 0-2 out of the gate? Yeah, well, they haven't done that since 2010. And another thing the Falcons have going for them is, is history. Matt Ryan uh, has never started 0-2 as a quarterback of the Atlanta Falcons. He's 6-0 and after losing week one. So both Brady and Pete like the Falcons, plus 4.5 on the road at Dallas and the <laughs> over 52.5. All right. The Rams, who beat the Dallas Cowboys on Sunday Night Football to start the season, are at the 0-1 Eagles, another team kind of with its back against the wall early because of that loss to Washington. This is a pick 'em, Pete. I love these kind of games in week two. You're never as bad as you look in week one. You're never as good as you look in week one. And now you have one of those teams that everybody's all hot to trot about, the Rams, going across <laughs> the country to play an Eagles team that looked Awful in the second half of the Redskins game. You know what that means? The Eagles are winning the game. Yeah, the line was banged up. Lane Johnson's supposed to be back. Uh, Miles Sanders supposed to be back at running back. They will run the football better. Uh, I think defensively they had some issues, uh, some busts in the secondary. I went back and rewatched that game. They will win this game. The Rams look good. They were at home. It was prime time. They were ready for that, and they game plan for that game. I think this is a tough situation for the Rams to go all the way across the country and play a good Eagles team that didn't look good last week. And by the way, Carson Wentz, you need to get rid of the football, buddy. He got sacked eight times, and three or four of those were his fault from holding the football. Brady, Carson Wentz, 14-15 and 15 overall in his last 29 starts, including the playoffs. Yeah, look, he's dealt with a lot of things around him, whether it's been injuries at the wide receiver position last year. We saw that uh, their offensive line has sustained some injuries. They've been able to overcome it at times, but uh, Pete touched on something. I mean, look, this front for the L.A. Rams is nothing close to what the Washington Redskins presented with all those first round picks and generating eight sacks. However, they do have maybe the best defensive player uh, in the NFL in Aaron Donald. So that's going to be a problem. That's going to be an issue. Uh, I think uh, Carson Wentz is potentially in for another long day if the Rams can play anywhere close to the amount of pressure uh, that they put on Dak Prescott a week ago. Uh, the biggest thing for me, I think, was the offensive line for the L.A. Rams. I thought they actually had a pretty solid game against the Dallas Cowboys considering where they were a year ago. Uh, and I think even Jared Goff had gone through some some rough times with that group as well as their running game. And clearly Todd Gurley is no longer there anymore. So uh, this is a matchup where it's a pick em for a reason. I think there's a lot of people who are kind of flipping a coin on this one. Uh, for me, though, I think Pete picks the Eagles because he had him as a top 10 team. He now dropped them <laughs> out of his power rankings into the 16th position because now he wants to catapult them back up and make good on what he thought was going to happen at, at, at the beginning of the year. So that's why Pete likes the Eagles. I'm on the other side of this one. I'm going to ride the momentum of the LA Rams. Pete talked about that long flight west to east to take on the Eagles. It'd be tougher if there was actually a home field advantage. There's not right now in the NFL, and I think the Rams right now are playing as the better football team. Time change, baby. That matters. Does it, it still matter? matter? So it that matters, matters more matters. than the home field advantage. It still matters. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you guys uh, disagree on mine that is, one. This is, by the way, this it, I don't pick a lock too often. Yeah, this is a lock? This is a lock. It's the, it's it's the, the Pete Crisco lock. lock of approval right Look at there. On, laughing. on the Eagles to win at home wait. in this pick. Yeah. Okay, moving on to the uh, the Panthers and the Bucks, a pair of 0-1 teams. Three of the four teams in the NFC South are 0-1. The only team that won was the New Orleans Saints. It's a big line here. A lot of people expecting Tom Brady and the Bucks to bounce back at home against a Panthers team that looked good on offense against the Raiders, but the Raiders went right through them on defense. The Bucks are favored by nine, Pete. Yeah, this is a bad defense because it's a young defense. It's going to take time for them to really gel and come together. So this should be a perfect situation for Tom Brady and the Bucks offense to get back on track. The problem is, where's the status for Mike Evans? Is he back being 100%? Doesn't look like it. Chris Godwin missed time in practice this week because of a concussion. What's his status going to be? Uh, I still think they will be able to move the football. They did not look good and in rhythm last week 
against the Saints. Is Gronk going to be a factor at all? In it? I mean, he's coming off retirement. People forget that. They just thought he'd walk back in and be <laughs> the same Gronk. He, he, it doesn't just happen. So I think that's not the concern. Uh -huh. The concern is Tom Brady. He has to get back to playing like Tom Brady. He didn't play well last week. This is the perfect situation to get back to doing that. And I think he does. Look, Carolina will score points. They're going to score a lot of points this year. I think Teddy Bridgewater in that offense, it fits with all the weapons, McCaffrey and that group. I think they'll score points. I do think that the Bucks get back on track on offense and they cover this number. I think this one might be ugly. I don't know if this one's going to be ugly or not. I do think the Tampa Bay Bucks win this game. But look, to beat a team by double digits in the NFL is tough, especially a divisional opponent. I think we saw from the Carolina Panthers in week one that they have the ability to score some points. Christian McCaffrey is going to be tough to stop uh, for a defense that even though the Tampa Bay Bucks match up well, looking at their linebacker group, Levante, David, Devin White, I think those guys can run well with Christian McCaffrey. I've just still got too many questions about their secondary and whether or not that group is going to be able to stop anyone and whether or not their front's going to be able to get pressure uh, on Teddy Bridgewater in this matchup. So uh, divisional opponents, uh, I, I do think, again, Tampa Bay Bucks, they'll get back on track. They'll be better than what they were um, a, a week ago. They're not going to have to deal with quite as bad of a pass rush as what they saw from the Saints. So uh, I think the Bucks win, but I'm going to go ahead and take the nine points. I think Carolina will be able to relatively stay within that range. The other three times Tom Brady lost the season opener. He went on to reach the Super Bowl 2003, 2014, and 2017. We'll see what happens in 2020. Recapping the picks, our first segment of picks here for week two from Pete Frisco and Brady Quinn. They agree on Pittsburgh and Atlanta, but that's about it. They differ on the, the Browns and the Cincinnati Bengals. And as we just heard, Brady thinks that though Tampa Bay will win, it's tough to beat a team by double digits in the NFL. He thinks Carolina is going to be able to keep that one close. Both the guys love the over in the Falcons-Cowboys game, the over 52 and a half. All right, we're picking early Sunday games against the spread. I'm Chris Hassel. I've got Pete Prisco six feet to my left. I've got Brady Quinn coming to us from his home studio. Uh, Vikings and Colts. It's a matchup of 0-1 teams, guys. Vikings looked terrible on the defensive side of the ball. Aaron Rodgers threw all over them, as, as Pete uh, will point out, he, that he thought that was going to happen. And the Colts, I feel like most of our experts were really high on the Colts this season, that they were going to win, and maybe they still will, win the AFC South, look really good doing it. But the, Pete, they lost on the road at Jackson. Yeah, and I was one of those people who picked them to win the division. I still think they will win the division, although Tennessee looked pretty good the other night. Here's the problem. Phillip Rivers turned the ball over. They didn't punt in that game. He think always turns the ball over. But them. they didn't punt. It was unbelievable. They, won they actually had no business losing that game. Didn't punt, went for over 400 yards of offense. He actually made some really good throws, made two really or three really bad throws, got away with another one of them, and they turned those, points, those turnovers into points. Gardner Minshew did some really good things for Jacksonville, but this was more about the Colts. And the other thing that I was disappointed in with the Colts, the young defense, the, where was DeForest Buckner? They paid a boatload of money for him. He barely made any plays. They're supposed to be better on that side of the ball, and they weren't, which is concerning. They didn't give up a ton of yards, but when you're point blank range, you got to try and stop them. I do think they bounce back in this game. Uh, the Vikings are a disaster, particularly on defense. The young secondary was torched last week. I think Rivers back home will bounce back, play well, get the ball to T.Y. Hilton, and the Colts will win this, and I think they'll win it pretty easily. I'm concerned about the Minnesota Vikings. I am too, Pete, and I think this is a bad matchup for the Minnesota Vikings defense. When you look at the production that Phillip Rivers put up, and as you said, I mean, besides a few mistakes, uh, he didn't play that bad. And it looks like he's developed chemistry uh, with Paris Campbell and some of the other receivers, too, in the Colts. So uh, I think this is going to be a tough matchup for that Vikings secondary, given how they played in week one. And also, again, th this defensive front for the Vikings, who's going to be without Daniel Hunter, they're going up against one of the better offensive lines, too. So, look, on the flip side of this, will, will the Vikings be able to score some points? potentially you know stay in this ball game to a degree uh, but I've got too many questions about that passing game uh, Thielen had a pretty good game but they need Justin Jefferson to step up in a big way that's a lot of pressure to put on a rookie and I think they've had a hard time getting first round picks at the wide receiver position in Minnesota to be able to do that so I like the Colts here too, laying the three points Vikings are 0-11 all-time at the Colts that's quite the stat Marlon Mack out for the season for Indianapolis so Jonathan Taylor Naeem Hines really going to step up uh, CBS, 1 p.m. Eastern Time Sunday. 1-0 Titans after that 
squeak by win at the Denver Broncos, taking on the, the surprising 1-0 Jacksonville Jaguars, but this is tied for the, the largest line of the weekend. The Titans are favored by nine at home. When you look at recent history of these teams playing in Nashville, you know why. Well, not recent history, all history. The Jaguars have won six times there in their entire history. I mean, that's terrible. They've always had problems with the Titans in Nashville, and this should be no different. The, the one thing about the Titans the other night, they dominated the game, should have won, missed field goals, should have won by a lot more. The flip side is the Jaguars won a game they probably shouldn't have won. They're not as good as they looked. The Titans probably not as bad as they looked, and so it's a bad combination. Derrick Henry, I saw this stat. On his, I think it's 10 touchdown runs against the Jaguars in like the last four games or three or four games. He's averaging 33 yards a carry on those touchdown runs. I mean, that one was 99, I think it was, or 98. <laughs> but still, they can't tackle him. They're not good enough against the run. Uh, the Colts got away from it last week. The Titans won't get away from it. They will pound Henry. And this is going to be one of those games where you say, you know what? Jacksonville is who we thought they were. I think the Titans handle him and win the game going away. Unbelievable. The mayor of Jacksonville, Pete Prisco, I can't even walk outside without someone asking for his autograph, would go against a team that's on a hot start right now, 1-0 against a divisional opponent, riding the mustache of Gardner Minshew. Unbelievable, Pete, that you would do such a thing. Brady, you know what? Brady it's more important to me to beat that, you than Brady. have my adoring fans of Jacksonville <laughs> come up to me. <laughs> well, you might be losing some Jacksonville fans, okay? That nine points is the highest spread we've seen tied with another game we already talked about uh, in regards to the Tampa Bay Bucks taking on the Panthers, another divisional matchup. So it's early in the season. This is another divisional matchup with a big spread. And so I'm going to ride on the side of the Jacksonville Jaguars until that some of that momentum runs out. I think if you look at Gardner Minshew, he's going to take care of the football. He's not going to put his team in bad spots. The way they utilize LaVisca Chenault, uh, their draft pick out of Colorado, running and catching the football to me is somewhat unique. I think it's going to be an interesting wrinkle to see if Mike Vrabel's defense can stop it. DJ Charks continued to be the lead wide receiver for them. And I do think they'll be able to run the football in spots against the Tennessee Titan. Look, at the end of the day, Will they be able to tackle Derrick Henry? I, I don't know. We're going to find out. But that nine points is a big spread. I'm willing to ride with the mustache and Gardner Minshew and lay the nine points or, or, or take the nine points. Jacksonville has not won in Nashville since 2013. Tennessee hasn't been 2-0 and since 2008. Uh, moving on to another CBS game early afternoon, 1 Eastern time. The 1-0 Bills, 5.5-point favorites at the 0-1 Dolphins, who didn't show much offensive capability at all against the Patriots. On the other side, Brady, Josh Allen, a career game in the opener. He looked good. Even though he missed a couple of passes, his numbers could have been better. He still looked really good. No, he looked incredible. I mean, it looked like he's finally a quarterback playing his third year. He's at the same system, and, and now he's got some wide receivers to throw to. You know, the emergence of John Brown last year is carried into this year. Uh, he looks like he's a nice option next to Stephon Diggs. Uh, and by the way, Beasley had a drop in this game. There were a couple that I thought were somewhat catchable. Uh, and last year, this was the second worst team in drops in, in the NFL. But no one wants to talk about that when we're talking about Josh Allen's, you know, accuracy or issues with it. Uh, but never mind that. I mean, look, the, the Bills are, I think, in a class – above right now where the Miami Dolphins and the New York Jets are within this division. Curious to see what they look like versus the Patriots at some point. Uh, but I think the only gripe I have about what I saw from last week's game against the Jets was stop letting Josh Allen carry the football so much. I know Brian Dayball, their offensive coordinator, talked about how a number of those were actually zone reads where he has the option to give or keep it. But don't give him that option. Just call the running plays. Let him hand the football off. If you want him to run the football, let him do it when he drops back and nothing's there like he used to do early in his career or have a quarterback design run because the two fumbles he had, they're A, costly within the course of a game. But when you force him to run the football that much, those sorts of things are going to happen and he might get hurt. So, look, maybe I look like a fish right now, but I like the Bills laying the points on this one, uh, even though, though the Dolphins are a home dog. And I do think they'll be a little more competitive than they were last week uh, versus the New England Patriots. I agree with you, Brady. I like the Bills as well. And I also agree with you. Stop running the kid. I don't care how big he is. And he is a big, powerful man. Quit running them. We see what happens to guys who run the football too much. Cam Newton was bigger, and he took a wear and tear on his body. you got to be careful with your franchise Is that your stance on, on all quarterbacks? Yes. I mean, Kyler Murray's running all over yeah, the place. Bench, but he, running to scram from a scramble is one thing. Running on a design called run is putting him at greater risk. they got to take off when there's nothing there, like Brady said, and get outside the pocket. Either make plays with your arm, ideally, or get out and run. But don't design runs for him. I hate that. You're going to take too much of a beating. I do like this Bills team. I told you I thought they'd be a deep playoff team. 
You know what happens this week? The two o'clock starts because Ryan Fitzpatrick was not good last week. Now, granted, he was playing New England on the road. That's not a great New England defense. Uh, he did not look good in that game. If he doesn't look good early in this game or even throughout the entire game, the 2 o'clock starts. So when does the clock strike midnight in your opinion? It might strike midnight at the end of this game. If he really? does not play well, it might be time to get two into the ball game because, quite frankly, he's just keeping the seat warm until he takes it over anyways. Get to it sooner rather than later. Okay, both Brady and Pete like the Bills minus five and a half, and, and maybe that's when they take over first place from the Patriots and never let go. The Patriots with a tough game that we'll get to a little bit later. Uh, the Lions, Brady, trying to bounce back after such a heartbreaking defeat, a total collapse against the Bears. They have to do it or try to anyway in Green Bay against the Packers who are feeling really good about themselves. And they should be. I mean, look, uh, they kind of gambled, if you will, in the offseason with their decisions in free agency and the draft. But it looks like it paid off, right? Mar uh, Marquez Valdez-Scantling and Alan Lazard really have developed and become a nice, you know, 2-3 option to Devontae Adams as the lead wide receiver. Uh, the only head scratcher, though, is, I mean, A.J. Dillon really didn't have much of a factor in the game. Their second-round pick out of B.C. Uh, clearly, Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams are, are better fit for their offense right now. But we'll see as that continues. Look, in this matchup, I think the Lions will be able to move the football and put up some points. Uh, the problem is more of their defense in my mind. I just I don't think they match up well. I think they're going to have a hard time getting pressure uh, versus that Green Bay offensive line who played well versus the Minnesota Vikings last week. But this, this one worries me, Pete. Uh, six points, a divisional game. It's not that much, and I think the Packers played great. But you hit on something a little bit earlier. You said you don't look quite as good as you were last week when you won or as bad when you lost. And I think that's probably the case uh, with both of these teams right now. So, look, Detroit's played them tough in the past. I think this game could be close. But right now, again, I'm just riding the momentum with a lot of these teams. I'm going to lay the six points and take Green Bay. Yeah, I'm going to lay the six points as well. Look, the Lions are banged up in the secondary. I mean, you look at the secondary. There's, they don't know what's going to happen with Jeff Okuda this week. He might play. Justin Coleman was put on IR. They are really dinged up in the secondary. And that's the last thing you want to have when you go play Aaron Rodgers uh, and what, after what he did last week. I always say Aaron Rodgers is at his best when the football is about helmet high. That means he's throwing rockets. He threw rockets the entire game last week. He is back to being the guy that everybody in the media buried. He is back to being Except a star. You. Except me, because uh, I still think he's a star. I think he's going to carry this team to the Super Bowl, and I think he's going to light up the Lions. Blowout city. Brady? I'm glad he didn't include me with a part of the media. I've never <laughs> lit him up. <laughs> One of the no, I didn't say ever. you. You're a member of the media, you, but it wasn't you. You just said that you were the only member of the media that didn't, so thank you for excluding me from the media <laughs> since... I don't really uh, categorize myself as that. Thank you. Matt Stafford's had success against the Packers. Four and one in his last five starts against Green Bay. And Detroit looked really good for the first three quarters. A, he's a member of the media. Yes, and he is. And B, you didn't actually kill him, but you weren't propping him up either, Brandon. Nobody right? loved the Packers and Aaron Rodgers more than, than this guy right here, Pete Prisco. Hey, I, these eyes, they see what happens. <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, both like the Packers to, to cover the six points against the Lions and Matt Patricia's job. Uh, starting to, to become more and more hot. Uh, moving on to the Bears, the team that beat the Lions with those 21 fourth quarter points Happy for Mitch guys. Trubisky. Hey, and he should be 2-0 and because they are home favorites against the Giants. Five and a half point favorites of the Bears. That line is going up. It was four and a half earlier on Wednesday, and it is now heading towards a touchdown. Well, that tells you how bad the Lions were in the secondary. They made Trubisky look right. good. I mean, that's, you can't do that. That's almost impossible. <laughs> and they did it. He looked good in the fourth quarter. He made some big-time throws. Credit goes to the quarterback. Can he do it again? Look, the Giants aren't a great team. They're not a great defense. He's going to have opportunities. But something tells me that the Giants, who are playing on a short week as well and now going on the road, are going to hang around in this game. Who's the better quarterback, Mitch Trubisky or Daniel Jones? I'd lean to Daniel Jones. And I think that's going to show up in this game. I think that the Giants hang around. I think the Bears win the game, and he does get to 2-0, but the Giants hang around. You know, it's funny. Even in a losing effort, you know, I try to take away some bright spots for the New York Giants. And driving down the field the way they did before Daniel Jones uh, got hit by Bud Dupree and turned the football over, it's kind of an accomplishment when you really think about how good the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, defense is. And for the most part, I thought that the offense for the Giants actually moved the ball pretty well. And the Bears don't have as good of a defense. Uh, and so I do think the New York Giants could be bringing some momentum with them in this matchup. In regards to the Bears and Mitchell Trubisky and the 21 points in the fourth quarter, that was great. But 
Again, let's be real. If DeAndre Swift catches the ball at him in the face mask while he's standing in the end zone, mm -hmm. we're not having this conversation about the Bears being 1-0. Uh, so I think if you're going to give me five and a half points between what I believe to be two pretty evenly matched teams, I'll, I'll go ahead and take it and I'll roll with the underdog in this one. Only one quarterback in the NFL threw three touchdowns in one quarter, and that was Mitch Trubisky when they needed it most in the fourth against the Lions, who completely collapsed. Uh, moving on again to another 1 o'clock game, the San Francisco 49ers, who some would say collapsed against Kyler Murray and the Cardinals in that fourth quarter at a Jets team that looked dreadful against the Bills in week one. Not looked is. They're a bad football team. The talent on that team is terrible. And everybody can blame Adam Gase for all you want, but the ter talent level on the New York Jets is awful. Isn't that also on Gase, though? Not really. He had GMs above him and still does, Joe Douglas. They can fix it, but uh, right now it's bad. You look across the board. The offensive line, eh, questionable. Uh, you look at wide receivers, they have nobody. Uh, you know, the running back situation, Le'Veon Bell's out now. And Frank Gore is five, 520 years He's old. He's your age. Hey, he's a little older than me. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he's going to be the lead runner. Uh, you go to the defense. Look, if the Niners needed a perfect situation to get right, this is it. It's still a long trip. That's concerning. They have major injuries. Now Richard Sherman's out. The other corner position was a disaster last week. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins is still catching passes for the Cardinals against them. And so I think that you know, the Niners didn't play well last week. Jimmy Garoppolo needs to play better, but this is the perfect situation. They will go into New York and handle a bad Jets team. Hold on, Pete. You're saying a West Coast team with a time change <laughs> can go to the East Coast and find a way of winning a football game? Oh, my gosh. I don't think that was even possible. Uh, look, I do have some concerns about the San Francisco secondary. Richard Sherman now joining the IR at least for three weeks with the change to the IR rules uh, for this season, which, by the way, I hope are actually a change for the future in the NFL and not having to stash a guy there for at least six weeks. Uh, but as, as Pete pointed out, clearly anyone opposite of Richard Sherman is always going to be a target when you face this team. And now, unfortunately for Robert Sala, their defensive coordinator, they don't even have a lot of depth on their roster. Jason Verrett was dealing with some injuries too entering into the season. Uh, you look behind Mosley, Akella Witherspoon probably won't be healthy for this game. They've got Tim Harris stashed on their practice squad. They may need to elevate him. They may need to bring someone else in too, or look at how they're going to have to play their nickel packages using three safeties as opposed to potentially uh, three cornerbacks. Or maybe they put Kwan Williams in a position where he's paying cornerback opposite of Mosley. No matter how you look at it, the problem for the Jets is they can't take advantage of it based on their inability really with the passing game that outside of Jamison Crowder having a long touchdown reception. That was pretty much it for their passing game last week. So I like the San Francisco 49ers flying all the way across the country, Pete, <laughs> to the East Coast, not bothered by the time change, and I'll lay the seven points. You missed the uh, lesson, the math lesson at Notre Dame when they gave you your grades where they said talent more valuable than travel. Okay, you <laughs> forgot about that. Talent is much more valuable than the ta than the travel. We'll so we'll make a t-shirt and you can wear that on the set one day. We know yeah. this, this 49ers have a lot more talent. How many than the grades Jets. did he get at Notre Dame? How many what, what? Did grades did they just give him at Notre Dame? Oh, yeah, all of them, right? He yeah. didn't have to go to class. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> Unlike you, Pete, I can't take those courses online like when you went to school. <laughs> so it's a little bit harder for me. It was actually I, I didn't. I was a finance major. I didn't necessarily have the best grades there in finance. Pete majored in partying and co-eds at Arizona Har State. I went to Harvard of the West. I don't yeah. know what you're talking about. Yeah. Arizona State University, where most parents don't want their kids to go. Correct. Okay, we're going to come back with more picks, but first a recap on what these guys would like uh, in the early games on Sunday, or at least some of them agreeing on, on Indianapolis, minus the three at home against the Vikings. Both the guys are way out on the Vikings. Uh, Pete likes Tennessee to cover that that nine point spread at home against Jacksonville. They agree on Buffalo, Green Bay, the Giants, and San Francisco. He's copying my paper this week because he knows I had a good week last week. Well, he needs to change it up to, to catch you. <laughs> He's three games back after week one. All right, we have Sunday afternoon picks with Pete Prisco and Brady Quinn. I'm Chris Hassel, just steering the ship here. 425 Eastern Time on CBS. We have the doubleheader this week. The 1 0 Chiefs, more than a touchdown favorite, eight and a half point favorite at the 1-0 Chargers. Chargers barely squeaking by the Bengals. They are at home. No one will be cheering for them. It'll be business as usual for the Chargers. It will be. Long trip last week. Remember, they went on a long yeah. trip to play, a tight game. Yeah, They're going to they be won. at home this week, and it's going to be a much <laughs> tougher game. Look at Brady. There's going to be a much tougher game. It's one of those situations where you know your opponent. That opponent 
is rested because it got extra rest, and it's the best team in the league. Having said all that, if you look at the way the Chargers have played against Patrick Mahomes, they play to keep everything in front of them. He was held under 300 yards in both games. Now, he did throw six touchdown passes in those games, but he was held under 300 yards in both games. They make him be patient. That usually means it's not going to be a blowout, and they'll keep everything in front of them. And I think that's what they'll do in this game. If you're going to give me that many points in a division game at home, I'm taking them. So I'll take the Chargers. Even though Brady hates the Chargers and doesn't make their playoff team, I'll take the Chargers plus the points. I just like like how Pete has rules that only apply in certain circumstances. No. Like he just said, in a divisional game with that many points. Have we talked about some other divisional games with some big spreads earlier in today's show? Oh, Pete, I love you. They weren't you're, at you're, home you're like, though. They weren't at home. You're like my who like constantly forgets what she says, and I have to remind her. Hmm. Uh, I think getting to that point, but let me just nope, put it. No, nope, no, nope. Chiefs are already playing at a playoff level. Their defense has improved and really carried on from what they did last year and helping them win a Super Bowl. Uh, the addition of Clyde Edwards Elaire, he's really the X factor. Pete could talk about them keeping everything in front of them. That's fine. But if you can't touch what's in front of you or you can't tackle what's in front of you, that's going to be an issue. And I think this offense has only gotten better as Miko Hardman has continued to grow. He's going to continue to be a piece of this along with Hill and Kelsey and Sammy Watkins and all their other pieces. So. I'm fine laying the eight and a half points because I don't think the Chargers are really going to be able to score much, at least the way the Chiefs defense looked with additional rest because a couple, you know, week and a half ago and how they looked versus a bad Cincinnati Bengals team. So I feel confident laying the points. And as, you know, Pete talked about, um, you know, look, it, it's not really, or as Chris mentioned, it's not really a home game uh, for the Chargers, but they're used to not playing in front of any, anyone. There's not much of an advantage there for that defense. I think that hurts the Chargers in this case. So I, I feel okay laying the eight and a half. Kansas City 29 and three in their last 32 division games. That's nuts. Uh, also at 425 Eastern time on CBS, Lamar Jackson and the Ravens off that blowout of the Browns, one and oh, seven point favorites at the 0 and one Texans. And who's Deshaun Watson going to throw the ball to other than I don't know. Uh, I mean, you got who? You got all those cooks in the group and every Will Fuller. They had 13 total catches. Terrible. Will Fuller had most of them. It's terrible. By the way, uh, Brady's mom might want to take his place in picking games. She might do better next week. <laughs> so. so my uh, grandma <laughs> back to you, though, Pete. Remember, you're back to a generation older, Pete. <laughs> oh, Pete. Uh, the Ravens will go in there and handle the Texans. The Texans are not a good football team. You know, everybody wants to say, oh, look, they won the division. They're good. They won the they're not a good football team. And it's not just because they traded DeAndre Hopkins. I think they have issues on the offensive line. They have issues on rushing the, about rushing the passer. They have issues in the secondary. And Lamar Jackson will light up that defense. And I don't think the Texans can compete with them uh, in terms of going up and down the field. Deshaun Watson was bad in the opener. And people, you know, he got garbage time stuff that made everybody in the fantasy community like Jamie Eisenberg all happy. <laughs> but he played poorly in that game. I don't think he bounces back and plays well. Baltimore goes in there and dominates. The, the fantasy game. community? Like yeah. it's just this little community <laughs> of people that play fantasy. It's Brady knows. Yeah, he Brady's always, not in the Brady's community. not in the fantasy community. <laughs> I'm not, and I'm not. I'm not going to get into this conversation that we're getting this right with Jamie Eisenberg, who's uh, constantly on our text chain, texting us, and also tweeting all the time. Uh, two things I don't really have much time for. I agree with Pete in this case, though. I think the Ravens are going to take care of business here. I am concerned just kind of about that overall reaction, overreaction that we have to Week One. When you look at the fact that clearly the Texans uh, weren't prepared, weren't ready for what they were facing from the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, but also their pass rush. You know, they don't have as much of a pass rush as they used to back in the days when J.J. Watt was helped. And obviously, Jadavion Clowney played a little bit more of a factor then, too. So I think it's a bad matchup for that, that from that standpoint. But I do think Deshaun Watson uh, will be able to improve to a degree throwing the football, whether it's Brandon Cooks, Will Fuller, Randall Cobb, Kenny Stills, or a combination of all of them. I don't think they're going to be this bad for the entirety of the season. So I'll go ahead and gladly lay the, the seven points here. It would not surprise me, though, if the Texans didn't somehow find a way to keep this one close hmm. uh, and, and somehow maybe even pull off a victory. That's kind of been wow. the story of the Houston Texans, Bill O'Brien, and Deshaun Watson. <laughs> I can't explain it. The only thing I can say is, like, that's what this team does. They will show up and surprise you every once in a while. Maybe this is one of those, uh, one of those situations. So, he, wait, he picked the Ravens hedged it and said it wouldn't surprise him if the Texans won the game. 
Yes, that's correct. Well, Pete, it's really because of travel, right? Baltimore oh is going on the East Coast. Pick to one team or the head. other. So, you know, that may play a factor because they're, you know, because of the time zones, Pete, that might play a little bit of a factor in how, you know, how the Baltimore Ravens, <laughs> travel, Ravens. you know that theory well, right? The whole talent and then you got the yeah. travel. Yeah, that, right? I know. They played last season. The Ravens won 41 to 7. Uh, also at 4 Eastern, a game Brady Quinn will be calling, so he can't pick this. No, he's not he allowed to pick it? He can't pick it. It's oh, a it's Washington fine. football team. Washington football team, right? At the Arizona Cardinals. Brady, both teams are 1-0. and This is a nice matchup for you. It is a nice matchup. Extremely excited about it, especially because... You know, you've got a quarterback in Kyler Murray who's got all that mobility, the ability to create, extend plays, and do something with his feet. And typically that nullifies a pass rush, especially one like we saw from the Washington football team week one versus the Eagles, generating eight sacks. And so it's going to be a ton of fun to watch and see how that plays out. One interesting little nugget from this is if you go back to last year, when Ron Rivera was with the Carolina Panthers and they took on the Arizona Cardinals, they also generated eight sacks in that game and that was early in the season that was a week three matchup so i am curious to see if potentially ron rivera jack del rio their defensive coordinator can come up with a rush plan or a way of scheming up the pass protection for the arizona cardinals and then really force kyler murray either to make some mistakes or hold on to the football where eventually they can get to him but either way i actually think this will this could potentially be a close game between the two teams i was uh you know kind of inspired by what i saw from Dwayne haskins taking care of the football, uh, making enough good decisions uh, to be effective in, in last week's um, in last week's win over the Eagles. And one thing I'll be curious to see is if they use him a little bit in some zone read running game. We didn't see him do it much in college, not much really last year. Scott Turner now, though, seems like he's implementing a little bit of that. Maybe it's just a rep, but maybe they're going to utilize him a little bit too in the running game. Can you tell he's researched this game he's a little pre- bit? He's prepped for this game. <laughs> he's prepped and ready to go. And he wouldn't make a pick, but we can hint and hear – who he's picking? He likes he likes the Washington football team. Think so? Okay. With the Who points. do you like? I like the Cardinals. I'm bullish on the Cardinals. I told you that before the season. I did, was not shocked that they won that game last week. They are a much better defensive team, and Kyler Murray will have a big day getting outside the pocket against that pass rush. I oh, like the Cardinals. All right. We've got two more games to pick: the Sunday nighter and the Monday nighter, and a great matchup between Russell Wilson and Cam Newton on Sunday night. Both teams one and zero. Both quarterbacks can be fantastic when they are on their games. We are picking week two games with Pete Prisco. I'm Chris Hassel, also joined by Brady Quinn. Sunday night football, Brady. 1-0 Patriots, 1-0 Seahawks. Are we going to see the same sort of rushing attack that we saw in that first game from Cam Newton? Well, first, are we even going to see a game right now, uh, given the potential concerns with wildfires up in the Pacific Northwest? Uh, and now obviously up in, up in Northern California, that's the first concern there. But as far as uh, Cam Newton running the football as much as he did, I mean, if that's how they feel like they're going to, you know, have to generate offense for the New England Patriots, I, I can promise you this, it's not going to be enough. And also this is a Seattle Seahawks team that's very prepared for a quarterback running game. Why? Because they have it and they face it all the time with their own offense given Russell Wilson's skill set and what he used to do a lot more early in his career running the football. So uh, I don't know that that's their best way of being able to hang in with a team that absolutely went into Atlanta and dominated. Russell Wilson was phenomenal. I think he's already put his hat kind of in the MVP ring very early on. And I also think he's going to be able to to have a a pretty big game this one too, kind of opening things up, throwing the football around. So I feel confident the Seahawks at home laying the four points. I also agree. I think the Seahawks are going to win this game, but I am concerned about some of the things that Pete Carroll said this week. We need to run the ball more. No, you don't. (laughs) You don't. Leave Russell Wilson alone. Play fast. Play loose. Let him throw on early downs. Let him throw on on, uh, early games. Are you sure he didn't say we we should have run the ball more against the Patriots in Super Bowl 48? Maybe he said that, but they need to let Russell Wilson play loose and free. Look at those numbers. 31-35, 322, and 4. Let him throw early in the game and on early downs. And if he does that, they'll dictate tempo. If you want to run in the fourth quarter with lead, have at it, Pete. I don't like that, but I think they handle the Patriots. I think the Patriots' defense is bad. It just happened to face a bad Miami offense last week. That'll show up this week. Okay, moving on to Monday Night Football. The Saints at the Raiders. And, Pete, this is the first game in Vegas, baby. Yeah, with no fans. No. I mean, it's sad. The it, it would, place would have been jumping. No. As it is, it's an e- a much easier game for the Saints, but no Michael Thomas. And that's a big hit to their offense. 
My concern, as it always is, is that that might mean more Taysom Hill for the New Orleans Saints. And if it means more Taysom Hill, that's a bad thing because that means Drew Brees isn't throwing the football. Having said all that, I think the Raiders defense is bad, and I think that the Saints will go in there and roll them. No matter who, well, as long as Taysom Hill's not playing quarterback. He can do his gimmick stuff and let Drew Brees throw the football around. Ready? I mean, the gimmick stuff was effective last time I checked how, how one worked out, so maybe they might need some of that. Although I'm with P, I don't suspect that's going to be the situation against uh, the Raiders' defense. Uh, they struggle versus the Carolina Panthers, who outside of Christian McCaffrey don't have a ton of offensive firepower. And, and, and Pete's right. I mean, without Michael Thomas, clearly that's a big hit, but that's why you have Emmanuel Sanders. Jared Cook has stepped up in a bigger role. Alvin Kamara has been a target, too, out of the backfield. I think they can find some production there. And then you do sprinkle in Taysom Hill to figure out another different thing to present the Raiders defense to deal with. So, look, if this was a little bit higher, let's say another point on this, like seven and a half, maybe I wouldn't feel as confident with that hook. But I think the Saints are good enough defensively to shut down or hold down the Las Vegas Raiders, even as good as they looked week one. I'm not, this is a different issue when you're facing the Saints defense uh, versus the Carolina Panthers. So I'll, I'll pick the Saints and lay the six and a half points here. All right, we're keeping score this year. Brady Quinn, three games behind Pete Prisco, picking against the spread. Pete, nine, six, and one. I'm going Brady, 11, six, five, nine, 11 and, one. and five this week. 11 and five, says Pete Prisco. Uh, Brady, Pete, thank you so much. We're looking forward to week two. This is a recap of the late Sunday afternoon games and the Sunday night and Monday night games. They both agree on those primetime games. You got the N.A. there, Pete, because Brady's not allowed to pick Washington he's, at Arizona. Is there he's a law the game. about that somewhere? I, there might be. Okay. Yes, there I'm might, worried about there, that. There might be. Okay. Uh, they agree on Baltimore covering against Houston, and they differ on Kansas City and the Chargers. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.